Today's show is brought to you by the Davenant Institute. We'll hear more from them later on in the show. Welcome back to the Irenic Protestant Podcast, a bi-weekly show where we strive together for the knowledge of God, his word, and his world through the lens of the classical and confessional Protestant tradition. I am your co-host, Jonathan McKenzie. I'm Jordan. And I'm Matthew. And we are the Irenic Protestants. Guys, how's it going? I'm doing good. Just uh, finishing up papers and all that, so... Little time. I'm doing great because I've already finished up all my papers and stuff. My semester just ended uh, Thursday. I turned in my paper right before midnight, 11.56. So I'm feeling good. It's summertime. It's good. It's a great time. What was the least favorite paper you wrote? What was a what? The least favorite paper you had to write. My least favorite paper. Um, my religion in America class is kind of, ooh, it can be very liberal. It gets annoying. Get this. Uh, maybe I'll get in trouble with some people for saying this, but one of the books we had to read was uh, Jamar Tisby's book on racism in America. And one of the arguments that he makes in the book is that evangelicals only started ca- uh, caring about abortion in the 70s or in the late 70s. Before that, the only reason, reason the religious right rose up was because of uh, segregation. We got to bring it back, boys. And that was, you know, there's more to it, obviously. But um my essay, I wrote my final paper for the class. It was a 10 page paper on the roots of abortion prior to Roe v. Wade among evangelicals and like their outspokenness against it and all that. So I basically just wrote a critique of Tisby and I, I got a 96 on the paper. So that was wow. nice to see. The Looks only reason like I got points off though was news. because the only reason I got points off though was because I quoted the Didache and he was like, this doesn't correspond to evangelicals in America. And I'm like, I'm just showing the roots, brother. Come on. But it's almost like you prophesied the recent the recent news about Supreme Court, maybe, maybe, yeah, supposedly, was, allegedly great overturning Roe v. Wade, um, which, man, it's that issue has been filling the Twitter feed, mm-hmm. you know, um, and so that's been that's been taking up a lot of thought in my mind the last several days. Um, yeah. But. You know what? I, I realize, guys, I may say what we're talking about today. So today we're supposed to be talking about um, the Lord's Supper, which, as you know, we've done once before. We've only really, really done one episode of the Lord's Supper so far. Yeah, I, I guess so. Jordan's, yeah. Jordan's episode. And today uh, we're going to talk about uh, the issue of frequency in the Lord's Supper. Um, so it's something that I've been uh, thinking about uh, a bit more since um, I've been at a church now since, well, almost a year now. This June of last year, but it's been almost a year uh, at a church that doesn't practice weekly uh, weekly Eucharist, but practices it um, biweekly during uh, the school year, and then once a week, uh, sorry, once a month over um, over the summer. So that's, it's, it's something that I've been thinking through because it's been a change of practice since I've left a uh, home. I've been at a church that practices weekly Lord's Supper. And that's because that's something that I used to very, very uh, hold strongly to be not only the ideal, but like the command of scripture. Um, so uh, when I switched to a church that was only practicing it, monthly or bi-weekly, I really had to slow down and be like, okay, I need to rethink this issue, actually examine the arguments again. So um, what is both of y'all's history with like the practice of the Lord's Supper and the frequency in churches you've been a part of? Um, and I, I assume, I'm, I'm pretty sh- sure we all know that both of y'all are weekly communion guys. And so how'd you get to where you're at currently? Jordan, why don't you start us off? Um, yeah, I originally was going to a baptist church that only did it i think it was monthly once a month and um but i didn't really see the need for it until i um actually started taking weekly communion at a um at my baptist church in in sanford where i'm at now and uh so it wasn't really a theological shift for me i mean that happened eventually but i um 
I just started once my uh, church started doing it, I realized, oh, wow, this is actually a lot more almost, uh, I guess, necessary um, than I than I realized. And I think you could kind of, um, you know, make the analogy of just like just food and, you know, um, trying to be nourished. And if you only take if you only eat once a month, um, you get used to it. But once you start eating weekly, you're like, wow, <laughs> I feel a lot better. So it's a. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it was really a theological shift after after I just started taking it weekly and realizing like, oh, wow, this is a lot more beneficial than I thought it would be, so. Yeah, and um, for me personally, I actually, so I grew up in megachurch context where communion was quarterly. And funny enough, when you have like a megachurch, you're not going to be able to vet all the people who take communion. So we obviously weren't pedo baptist but I was, it was basically pedo communion because I'm just like a little, I'm a little fella just sitting in the chair and my mom's like, okay, here's your cracker. Here's your grape juice. And so I'm like unbaptized <laughs> doing it there. But uh, yeah, it was very rare. It felt like. Um, and then I started going to a, uh, Presbyterian church. Once I started inquiring into uh, Presbyterianism, I was originally going back and forth between that and Lutheranism. And ironically enough, because of my convictions on the supper, I stayed reformed. Um, were you about to say something, Jonathan? Ironically enough. <laughs> ironically enough. Ironically, yes. Um, that was that was great. But uh, yeah, I, so I just started. Um, I realized I went from being quarterly to monthly. So we bumped up a little bit. So with Jordan, with your story, you were doing it monthly and then weekly. Other way around, it was quarter or not other way around, but you get what I'm saying, quarterly and then monthly. And so I was like, oh, this is pretty neat. I'm doing this more frequently. And the more I studied, the more I realized that it would actually be a really good thing to do this weekly. And something I actually did was I wrote a letter to my church's session after talking to my former associate pastor, former, because now he's pastoring a church in California. God bless him. He's in California now, but he started pastoring a church out there. But before that, I used to have frequent conversations with them and he was an anti weekly communion, but he wasn't really pro. He's like, be pretty cool, but you know, why don't you write a letter to the session about it? And so I did that. And what happened was, is by the time he left, they didn't have two um, teaching elders and only in the PCA, only teaching elders can administer or like, um, you know, consecrate the elements and all that jazz. So only teaching elders can do that. So we only had one. And after I wrote the letter, they were saying we could do weekly communion during Lent and in Advent season. But other than that, you know, just different things. But I know I'm kind of rambling at this point, but what mainly made me come to the convictions about weekly communion was realizing the particularity of the supper and how it differs from other thing, other means of grace in the Christian life. And then also the analogy that you gave Jordan about, you're not just going to eat once and then you're good. You eat every day, you know? So likewise, we should be nourished with the supper every Sunday. But yeah, that's kind of just a broad overview of where I'm coming from. Uh, so, you know, I grew up in that uh, Calvinistic uh, reformed dish Baptist world, the very MacArthur-y type world. Um, the, the Bible church world is usually what that's called. Um, and we... When I growing up, we practiced the Lord's Supper um, once once a month, first day of the month. And I thought that's kind of the only way you did it. Everybody I knew kind of did it that way. Um, and there was, you know, even though I'd say that like the view of communion that I absorbed, maybe it wasn't explicitly taught, but absorbed was a very memorialist, remembrance only, you know. Uh, doctrine of communion there was a big emphasis on examination so i remember i was kind of taught okay you know they're they're passing out the elements you get you get the bread the first thing you do and take the bread is you sit down you just take a minute and you pray and you repent and you get right with god and then you take the bread and you get the wine and then and when you get the wine that's when you that's when you thank god so i think thanking christ for what he did for me and all that and i take it and so there was a there was a big emphasis on self-examination um and then the reason for monthly, I never really understood the reason we did it. And, you know, uh, I, I, I kind of assumed that's just the way you did communion. And then when I got into early high school, I was, that's when I was listening to a lot of the, you know, young grass reform guys that became Presbyterians, so like the reform pub cast and, you know, people in that orbit. And they were all, you know, the trendy thing at the time for PCA church plants was we're a weekly communion liturgical rock band church that's kind of you know it's that's what the trendy <laughs> thing was 
and you still see that like trend in like most PCA church plants. A lot of them are weekly communion, liturgical ish with, with geeters, you know? So, but even before I came to like the reformed doctrine of the Lord's Supper, I was like, well, you know, weekly communion just makes sense. Like it's an element of worship. We need to remind her every week of, you know, Christ and what he did for us. I remember having a conversation with my dad, you know, who was my pastor growing up as we were moving to Illinois or driving up and we we're talking with the community. He's like, yeah, I mean, it's probably the, the better, the better way to do it. And that's, that's, it's a good, it's a good way to do it. Um, and so I was, I, I never had a pushback, I guess, from like my pastor who already is against the communion. Um, and then I think once I adopted the reformed doctrine, of the word supper, where and through the supper, you know, we actually do receive the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins and for, you know, receiving the divine life into our soul. Um, yeah, I kind of wanted that every single week, you know, I kind of needed that every single week, I thought. Um, and up until recently, I would have been very, very like adamant that like, you know, ministers ought to administer the Lord's Supper every single week to their congregants. And if they're not, they're depriving them of the gifts and graces of God. Um, but that, that started to change for me um, when I started reading uh, some of, I went ad fontes back to the sources, you know, and started reading um, some of the, uh, the early Anglican divines and kind of immersing myself in the prayer book tradition and noticing like, oh, weekly communion in the average parish church is a, is a very late invention. And a lot of it comes out of, um, at least in the Anglican world, it came out of like Anglo-Catholic influences. Um, that that kind of was like, well, you know, this is this is the means by which God bestows forgiveness of sins to His people. So therefore, you should do it every single week. Um, but I noticed in the ref, in the in the in the lot of the you know early Reformed, the reason for not practicing weekly communion, like for Cranmer or um, you know for I'm trying I'm trying to find examples and not coming but was because of the emphasis on proper you know examination and proper preparation for taking the Lord's Supper and like you know it's it's better to it's better to take the Lord's Supper less with proper preparation than take it every single week in judgment because you didn't prepare properly and so that's what I've been thinking through was, you know, I, I noticed in a lot of weekly communion circles, there's this emphasis on we need it to be fed. We need it to receive the body and blood of Christ. I don't notice the, the, um, the emphasis upon self-examination and proper preparation that you might see in circles that historically might see in, in circles like uh a classical, you know, reformed Anglican where they practice it four times a month, you know, first in the month of Holy communion, the rest of the Sundays were morning prayer. But then the week before, you know, weekly communion, they, they sent out a notice saying, Hey, we're having communion, better get yourself right. Cause it's about to happen. And so I've been I've kind of taken a pause. I've been like, Hmm, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if weekly communion is, is the, is the right thing for every single church to be doing um, because well, because not, not because in certain traditions, it seems like there's an overemphasis on the sacraments over the word and other traditions there's a certain emphasis where the word just completely trumps the sacraments. So I sent out this tweet the other day and I was like, I said, you know, Presbyterians should practice weekly communion. Anglicans should practice monthly or biweekly communion. He who hears, let him understand. And my point with that was, well, Presbyterians, historic, not historically, just modern Presbyterians, um, until recently seem to have had a pretty low view of the Lord's Supper. Like you go read Hodge and he's like, ah, man, Calvin's view of the Lord's Supper. That's a blot upon his whole, you know, life and work. Said like, contra well, Nevin. I know. I, I got my <laughs> Nevin right here. Said contra, said contra Nevin. Um, but, uh, and so the word and the word preached which we would affirm is the primary means of grace because it's the converting grace, but it's, it's been placed up inordinately above the sacrament, the sacraments diminish in their efficacy, right? So a way to correct that maybe is, well, practicing a good communion, reminding people that this is a, this is a part, one of our ordinary means of grace that does bestow grace, right? Um, but on the Anglican side of things, you know, the word 
has kind of been trumped, you know, the average Anglican church that I've kind of been to, it's like the 10 to 15 minute little sermonette. And then you have your whole long Eucharistic liturgy. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe a way to overcorrect that, not overcorrect, maybe a way to correct that is just practice communion less and have longer preaching, more word-based um, services uh, three times a month than do your communion service once a month. Um, I don't know, do you have any thoughts about that logic and uh, where I uh, I might be seeing things wrong? Uh, I definitely, I have a lot of thoughts. Yeah, I don't actually think you're super off. I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. But uh, a few comments I would like to add uh, just to contextualize things. First off, um, the idea of frequent communion. When you look at it in a modern context, you think of weekly communion. The first thing that comes to many people's minds is, oh, Roman Catholics or uh, Eastern Orthodox or, you know, the Anglo Catholics. And again, well, again, in an American context, you'll think of Roman Catholics. But for the for the reformers and specifically Calvin, who was for weekly communion, even though that wasn't able to happen, it had to be monthly. The reason there is an emphasis on a weekly communion was because first off they did have a very high view of the sacrament as being something that is nourishing but also when you looked at the roman catholic church at the time they only did it maybe once a year and they're like oh well you know it's good enough to kind of watch it happen it's kind of like when you hear a lot of critiques of like a lot of the contemporary uh worship style or whatever most of the time it's because it's like all the focus is on the person and they're the ones singing their their little old hearts out with these beautiful ballads while all the other people are like uh, you know, they're not really singing that loud. They can't really participate. They're just observing. And back then that was kind of the same thing with the supper. They were just observing. They weren't actually participating. So the context of frequent communion in that time period was because the, sac the sacrament of the supper is not just something that you just look at and observe. It's something you participate in because that's what Paul says is a participation in the body of Christ. So likewise to frequently observe su supper is to participate in it. So that's one thing I just want to add for the background is that the context is participating frequently because of it being deprived. And another thing I'd like to add is what you were saying is about you not being sure it would deprive people. In a sense, I would kind of agree, but also disagree. And with that, I would like to read this one quote from Calvin. It's from his short treatise on the Lord's Supper. He said, it is indeed true that this same grace, the grace that's in the word, the same grace is offered to us by the gospel Yet as in the supper, we have more ample certainty and fuller enjoyment of it. With good cause, do we recognize this fruit as coming from it? So with that, it's not like you're going to hell if you don't have the Lord's Supper. It's not like you don't receive, you receive Christ in the word, but in the supper, you, uh, or you receive Christ less, a lot less than the supper. You still receive Christ, but there is something peculiar about the Lord's Supper that, um, in the word. But I think what that goes to show is that, even if you don't have the Lord's Supper one Sunday, you still do have Christ, but there still is something that is missing a little bit. Is that making a little bit of sense to y'all? That, 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 that makes sense. Um, but I would say, you know, Calvin advocating for the communion is one thing, but the modern, the modern Presbyterian church that only worships on a Sunday morning is another thing. So, you know, Calvin, um, I have a, prof a certain church history professor here at RBC, Dr. Tweedell. He brings up that, you know, well, for Calvin, that he had preaching services every single day throughout the week. So mm -hmm. you're, you, you're having, you're having five sermons, five or six sermons per administration of the sacrament. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it just seems like with Calvin practice with communion, you're not going to have the, 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 uh, how do I say this? You're not going to run the you're not going to run the risk of the sacrament be trumping over the the word because the word is still being preached regularly, right? But um, in the modern in the modern Presbyterian or Anglican or Baptist church, they're only worshiping, you know, one Sunday. So once once on a Sunday, and so um, I don't know how you can properly prepare in the service or prepare the people before the next service for the Lord's Supper when the Lord's Supper is the only service you ever have, right? It'd be, it'd be one thing if, you know, every Lord's Day you had a morning service, which was a primarily the preaching service, focus on the word, 
and that prepared people for a later evening service where you practice the Lord's Supper every week. That's one thing. But if, if, you, if the Holy Communion is the only service you're ever practicing, how are you properly preparing your people to receive the body and blood of Christ? Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah, but can't that be applied to other aspects of worship as well? So it's like, maybe we should just do the confession of sin once a month. I mean, it's so frequent. You just go, oh, you know, I confess this, I confess that. But if you really have time to think about it and then you approach God congregationally with everyone and then you confess your sin and you hear that assurance of pardon, if you do that once a month, that gives people time to contemplate their sins, to think about it. You know, why do we sing um, a song right before the service ends? We should sing less songs. The sermon will have more time. There's more dedication to the word preached. And the next time you sing that song, you're going to sing even more boldly. So I feel like with that logic, I think it is consistent, but I think it's consistent insofar it's applied to other areas of worship, basically. Right. And I think that's the argument I've made in the past as well. You know, Acts mm-hmm. 242, they, ted- they dedicated themselves to the apostles preaching, the breaking of bread, the fellowship and the prayers. So if you walk into a church and they said they only preached once a month, would you say they're dedicated to the apostles preaching? Well, you'd say no. If you walked in, they said we prayed once a month. Would you say they're dedicated to the prayers? You'd be like, well, no. If you walked in and they, you said, you know, they said they only meet once a month. Would you say they're dedicated to fellowship? No. So ergo, if you walk into a church and they say they only break bread once a month, you know, are they really dedicated to the breaking of bread? And I think there's, I think there's a, there's definitely a pungency to that, to that argument. And I'm really sympathetic towards it, but I think the Lord's supper is different is, is an element that's different and distinct from the rest of the elements in the service, even, even like a baptism, because there's certain, um, there's a certain weightiness to the proper administration of the supper. You know, mm-hmm. Paul doesn't say, if you go into church and listen to the sermon with a bad attitude, you're going to die, right? But he does say, unless you examine yourself, if, in, you know, you, in, in, unless you examine yourself, you're, you're going to like bring absolute condemnation and judgment onto yourself in the Lord's Supper. So there's a certain weightiness of promises and cursings attached to the supper that I don't see attached to the preaching of the word or to those other elements. Um, so ergo, a higher level of preparation for this element seems to be required. And I guess that doesn't negate the argument for doing it weekly, but it does, it, it would then require, in my opinion, some type of prep preparation service to the Lord's Supper um, to prepare for, for the service of the Lord's Supper um, that you don't see happening in the modern reformed whether that be baptist dutch presbyterian or anglican church yeah jordan you have something to say yeah i mean i think it would depend on exactly how you're defining and just understanding the um importance of preparation because if if like if if you're arguing that preparation needs to be to this um you know extreme degree to almost kind of match the um the weightiness of the Lord's Supper, um, then, you know, I, I mean, I get what you're saying. I just think that when we th- do preparation, it, it should be a solemn thing. It should be, um, we should be sober minded when we're doing it. But, you know, I think examination has to do with just like repenting of sin and um, trusting in the gospel. And I don't think it's, it's really that much of a, I mean, you can always go um, anyone can always go back to our episode on it, but uh, mm-hmm. it's um, I think it's a relatively simple thing to prepare and um, it doesn't take much time. You could do it in 30 minutes. You could do it less than that. But if you want to, you know, somewhat serious, I guess, preparation, you could do 30 minutes. And I think that prepares you adequately for the supper. And so I would think that then you could take the supper that later that day or the next day or whenever you do it so you know what i'm saying so yeah i get what you're you're saying i think that's true but that's also assuming that you don't have any you don't have any uh quarrels with any of your brothers and sisters in christ um at at that moment before the supper you know because you can't make a sacrifice unless your sacrifices are going to be pure and so for example the last two times that's been a communion sunday at my at my church saint paul's the literally the person I was sitting next to refrained from taking the supper because they realized that morning, oh, I have a strife with this person and I need to make that right. 
So I'm not going to take this. I'm not going to take the supper. I think that's right. You shouldn't be taking the supper if you're in open, you know, just dis- open, um, sinful, you know, disagreement with the brother or sister Christ eat offended. But a big part of that was because they didn't, they forgot that like that Sunday was the Lord's Supper Sunday. So because there wasn't an emphasis on like preparation prior to that Sunday, you know, it crossed their mind that it was the Lord's Supper Sunday. And so they didn't, they didn't come ready, to, you know, making, making it right for neighbor before they came off of the sacrifice. Right. So um, if you're doing communion weekly, I mean, how, how are you making sure that everybody in that church is on task, making things right with one another? I mean, I guess, I guess the answer could be just like say, you just like emphasize it more in the sermon and have a culture where like, if you have an issue, like you fix it, you know, don't, yeah. don't wait. I mean, what I was kind of thinking is I think this comes, comes down to making sure that your ministers properly fence the table. Every single time that we have communion, my pastor, he might not go like super hard on the warning, like every single time, but he always is like, this is something very serious. And Paul said that people died unworthily partaking it. So I think that what this kind of comes down to is just in pastoral training and when you consult with pastors, make sure that when you do partake of the supper, there is this emphasis on the, you know, the drastic nature of this and how awful it is to partake unworthily. And yeah, I just think that when it comes to training ministers, when it comes to existing ministers, just emphasizing that when they fence the table, they need to actually fence the table. They're not just like, it's not just like, oh, well, you know, come if you feel welcome. Like they're like, they're someone who is protecting their sheep. They're protecting their flock. They're making sure those who are on like um, wolves don't partake of it, but they're also making sure that their sheep are protected and they're not eating and drinking judgment on themselves through unworthy participation. So what this comes down to is I think this is also uh, a pastoral thing as well. This is something that pastors need to work on because Jonathan, I think that a lot of your points, they do make sense specifically in this uh, context that we have right now, where there's not that as much emphasis on the supper. If you were to have like kind of like a lowish view of the supper and just be like, okay, every week, let's go. You know, then at that point, sure. It might get a little bit crazy because people are just going to be like, yay, uh, this is just only just a little symbol of what he did or whatever. It's not, doesn't really mean much. This is kind of just like a DLC package for the sermon, you know, when, no, uh, it's not just a little add on for the sermon, you know, uh, Thomas Watson. It's a DLC package. Yeah. It, it's not just DLC. You no, know, it's a part of the, the set. And, um, I, this is a great book on the supper from Thomas Watson. It is just called the Lord's supper. Very short, but it's one of the richest things I've read. He says, Um, about the Lord's Supper, he says, a sacrament is a visible sermon, and herein the sacrament of the supper excels the word preached. The word is a trumpet to proclaim Christ. The sacrament is a glass to represent him. And so with that, there is like an emphasis on the fact that the word is also, we can't separate the word from the sacrament. Augustine says a sacrament is a visible word. So there's a preaching of the word of God, and then there's a celebration of the supper. And the supper is not like something super distinct from it, but it's in addition to that. It's a part of that because it's the it's a visible sermon. So we need to realize that this is just a continuation of what the pastor was doing before, but it's something where it's it's very serious as well. So again, I think this is a pastoral question as well, making sure that shepherds are guarding their flock against an unworthy partaking. Richard Hooker is often known as the father of Anglicanism, but his is a legacy that demands to be claimed by all Christians, and especially all magisterial Protestants. His magnum opus was the laws of ecclesiastical polity. At the heart of this work is Book 5, which is dedicated to a point-by-point defense of the Reformed Catholic liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer. Although more than four centuries old, many of the issues that Hooker addresses here like the role of music and worship, the importance of visible symbols to accompany the spoken word, and the pros and cons of written prayers, remain as relevant as ever in intra-Protestant debates over worship and liturgy. And at the center of Book 5 is one of the most beautiful and powerful little theological treatises in English-speaking theology, as Hooker gives his account of the Christology and sacramentology that should undergird our worship. This summer at Davenant House, join Richard Hooker scholar Dr. Bradford Littlejohn for a deep dive into the riches of this classic text. During this five-day intensive course, 
Soon so read through the entirety of books 4 and 5 of the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, in which Hooker gives his defense of English public worship. Students will also discuss key passages in depth with an eye to historical contextualization and contemporary application. And of course, every day will be framed by a celebration of morning and evening prayer according to the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, so that we can not only learn about the liturgy, but live the liturgy together. This summer intensive course and a few others will be hosted at the Davenant House, the Davenant Institute's beautiful campus in Landrum, South Carolina. The yearly labor cost for this course, if you sign up before May 13th, is $375, which includes airport pickup, meals, and lodging. If Richard Hooker isn't your thing, then check out the other exciting summer intensives at davenanthouse.org. Davenant Hall is a found near the ancient university for the digital frontier, grounded in the wisdom of the classical Protestant tradition. Yeah, um, you say yeah uh, I guess um, earlier just talking about kind of why I switched over and it was more of a kind of practical thing, noticing the effects um, after I uh, started taking the weekly communion. But um, one thing that theologically, I guess, or more theoretical that kind of changed my mind on it was, um, um, well, it was John Owen, of course. <laughs> but uh, of course, of course. Uh, he talks about how taking the Lord's um, Supper is kind of partaking on your end of the covenant and fulfilling the stipulation of the covenant that God has given you and um, that God offers to be your God and your response is that you are his people, you know, in some sense. And so taking the Lord's Supper, you know, um, you know, hearing the preached word, um, partaking of baptism and all those things are you, um, you were stipulating in this covenant that there's a promise and there's benefits if you do your part. And that's true with the covenant of grace as well, you know? And so uh, one part is, or just one point is just like, you know, God is your God and you are his people. So be his people and kind of fulfill your role as his people by taking the Lord's supper as often as you can. And, and as, as often as you can, I obviously wouldn't mean Calvin's view of, <laughs> every day but uh but like every every lord's day so why not um <laughs> well i think i think your point makes more sense with his view of every day like i i, I don't think you really would be able to properly because i guess what i was thinking when you were talking about that friend that you're sitting next to who had a strife and didn't realize it and, or you know forgot it was the lord's supper uh the day of the lord's supper and uh you know it's like if that can happen at a church that's only doing it bi-weekly how much more would that happen at a church that's doing it every day of the week, you know? And I, what? Well, I, I guess this, this is a question I, I want to bring up is that when it comes to frequency, do I get more Jesus the more I take the Lord's Supper? Like, is it an incremental, incremental thing where every time I take it, I just get objectively more sanctified. So therefore taking it as much as possible is like the goal you know uh thomas watson on that he actually makes a he makes a really good point i don't think it's getting to like the core of what you're saying but something yeah. um that he mentioned is uh i i, I love thomas watson I, i'm usually known as a vermigli stand but thomas watson is really getting up there but he when he was talking about the supper one of the points i don't have the quote on me but one of the points that he made was that the supper is great because if you just feast on earthly food and you keep eating and eating and eating, you get sick and you just want to throw up and you just like you get fat and it's just it's bad it's not good for you but here in the supper you can feast all you want. And all you do is you just get more and more and more and more of Christ. And the thing is, is that it's just consistently nourishing. Like you can't get like sanctified too much. Is it going to be like, Oh, well, I do. I need to get sanctified more. No. So, you know, but it's not like, it's not like you're, you don't have Jesus anymore if you don't have the supper, but it's just, you know, it's something that is good. To, I would say it's good to have a lot of, but if you don't have it, it's not like you're, you're less holy, I guess you could say. I haven't articulated my thoughts on it like completely and totally, mm -hmm. but I would say more communion is great and it gives you a ton of Christ. If you only, if you have less communion though, you still have Christ, that is sufficient. 
Christ is given to you in the word and that's what you need. So I don't know. I, ho- I hope that makes sense. But yeah, I, I just saw the Thomas and Lawson quote where he's basically saying, you'll never have too much Christ with communion. Jordan, do you want to finish your thought that I so rudely interrupted? No, I mean, like, yeah, I, I guess I'd have to think more about why I wouldn't hold to Calvin's perspective. I, I feel like right now it's more of a, just a natural inclination to not mm-hmm. do that, but I, I, I haven't really um, ratified any views on that. I, but I feel like there probably is something cons- uh, about the Lord's Supper um, specifically being taken on the Lord's Day, but I... Um, okay. You know, I haven't. I, I I don't know if I can give a great defense for that at this moment. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think like I I guess I'd agree in some sense with Calvin's just like take on it. It's like if if let's say there is no argument to just take it on the Lord's day. It's like I I really do I guess think that frequency. Um, I mean, sorry. I guess with what Matthew's saying is like yeah, you you can't you you can have um you can always have more Christ, you know, and everybody has Christ. So if you take it less or you take it more, you still have Christ, but there is a, a spiritual benefit to taking the Lord's supper. And so it's like, if you take it more, I think that if you take it rightly, that there is a benefit that you're receiving more often than those who aren't receiving it. And so Jordan, can I right. steal your John Owen thunder real quick? Uh, do you have to finish your thought though? Um, yeah, just give me one second. Okay, so yeah, I think, uh, I think, you know, if you are going to receive it more, um, I think you're going to receive more benefits. And, and, and so like, I think ultimately I get what, if that's maybe more what Calvin was maybe arguing for, then I like, I get it. Uh, I just, I'm not sure if I would apply that to every day. And, and exp- um, especially because of maybe one of the things that you were even mentioning, Jonathan, just like, I mean, I was uh, saying it earlier, just that, um, if your friend could have that issue in two weeks bi-weekly communion, then I feel like that, that would be a kind of a rampant issue in, in everyday communion as well as um, not having time to repair, especially if you're for some reason adamant on taking it every day and then you have a full-time job and things like that. And so it's just like, it just seems there'd be some practical issues with just having it every day. Um, But yeah, Matthew, you can go ahead. Yeah. Um, And before I even say this, what I'm kind of noticing with this discussion is that the reason why the the Romanists withheld communion for like an entire year and all that was because they had just like this overly high view of it as in it was like a propitiatory sacrifice almost, you know, and or like, you know, representation, yada, 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 all, all their all their new my nuance and all that. But also just even the reason why some people would want to do it once a month is because of having a high high view of the supper. And the reason why some people want to do it once a week is because of a high view of the supper. So what I'm noticing is that all of us, we have a very high view of the sacrament. And that was partly why I was saying that I want to make it, you know, weekly, but also there is a danger in saying that in having an over, like way too high a view, you know, and over emphasizing that. And Jonathan, I think that's what you were getting at with the, the Anglo-Catholic community maybe, or like, you know, just the influence of that is having like an overly high view where the sacrament trumps the word of God and that can't happen. And so I think that if it was done weekly, sure, you know, now it's going to be, oh, well, now this is normative. But that just means that it's, you know, the Sunday service itself, it shouldn't just be normative. And the Sunday, a typical Sunday service, that's like, we're worshiping the the living God gathered together as a church. So there's something significant about that. But anyways, I'm getting to this, uh, all that to say, I'm getting to this John Owen quote that I, I think it's beautiful. I believe I've sent it in a group chat before, but it just goes to show that about the unique and special nature of the Lord's Supper. And with this, again, I know all of us are kind of influenced with our positions on having this high view of the supper, but just reading this, it it makes me want it every Sunday. Uh, Maybe I'm getting selfish, but I want it every Sunday. Just listen to this. It is a common received notion among Christians. It is true 
that there is a peculiar communion with Christ in this ordinance, which we have in no other ordinance, that there is a peculiar acting of faith in this ordinance, which is in no other ordinance. This is the faith of the whole church of Christ and has been so in all ages. This is the greatest mystery of all practicals of our Christian religion, a way of receiving Christ by eating and drinking something peculiar that is not in prayer, that is not in the hearing of the word, nor in any other part of the divine worship whatsoever, a peculiar participation of Christ, a peculiar acting of faith towards Christ. This participation of Christ is not carnal, but spiritual. In the beginning of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, when he began to instruct them in the communication of himself and the benefits of his mediation to believers, because it was a new thing, he expresses it by eating his flesh and drinking his blood. John 6, 53, quote, except ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Unquote. This offended and amazed them. They thought he taught them to eat his natural flesh and blood. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They thought he instructed them to be cannibals, whereupon he gives them that everlasting rule for the guidance of the church, which the church forsook and thereby ruined itself. Saith he, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It is a spiritual communication, saith he, of myself unto you, but it is as intimate and gives as real an incorporation as if you did eat my flesh and drink my blood. And something I'm noticing there too, is that a lot of people kind of like, they like to dunk on uh, reform people be like, oh, spiritual presence. So Jesus is kind of just like a ghost and he's just like spiritually present. And in reality, that's our view. Of the, the reform view of the supper is a very high view because we don't see spirit as like ethereal matter kind of thing. And it's just, you know, it's not as real as like, physical flesh and blood, like you you chewing on Jesus's thumb or something, you know, the local carnal presence, like, oh, I got a, I got a Jesus nail or something, God, but I hope that's not blasphemy, but it's not like that. That's not actually as real to a spiritual eating is so much more real than anything that could be a physical eating. This, there's a true communication with Christ here. And it's something that's beautiful. And because of that, again, maybe I'm just being selfish here, but I'd love to have that every week. And I think that could happen if we really were serious about instructing people about the nature of the sacrament, why it's so important to truly examine yourself and not just willy nilly, yum, yum, you know? I think, yeah. Amen. Amen. And so I think to, to take, to take my, my devil's advocate hat off. I mean, I, I think I'm still very much a weekly communion guy. Um, and for, for a number of reasons, but I think, you know, when I made that Twitter post, it was, it was, it was intentionally made to start a conversation because I wanted to see angry, angry Anglican Twitter come at me with like the best of like their defense, you know, and I got a lot yeah. of good answers and a lot of them was like, yeah, we, we understand Well, Brandon Meeks, um, who, you know, is very, uh, uh he's, uh, pretty well known in the Anglican circles, wrote a book on preaching, very, very neat guy. He, you know, was like, well, Jonathan, you bring up like good concerns and valid, valid concerns, but like the answer is to take communion away from the people. The answer is just to like educate the people. And I think, I think, I think he's right there. Um, I think the answer to my, my objection to the communion is that we need, we need actually in a, a more intense uh, uh, religious piety, like we need people that are dedicated to the church, dedicated to godly living, and dedicated to putting their bottoms in the pew uh, at any time a service is called. And like, if that's the culture, right? Like, the seriousness of a sacrament is going to happen. Examination is going to happen. Um, but I don't think that's possible if you're only doing one service a week on a Sunday morning, and that's your Holy Communion service. I think. I think. The, the answer to weekly communion is like being a multiple services on a Sunday, two services on a Sunday, a service on a, you know, one service on Wednesday type church where you're, you're, you're preparing to take the sacrament together as a body. I think that's one critique I had of like Owen in like preparation is that preparation is made to be a very individualistic thing and not a corporate thing, but the Eucharist isn't a, isn't a sacrament for you. It's a sacrament for y'all, if you get what I mean. And so the church is prepared. It's the body of Christ giving the body of Christ to the body of Christ. So exactly, exactly. It's the church. The church needs to prepare together. I think, you know, an example of this is like, 
you know, in Scottish Presbyterianism, you know, you know, where they still only practice communion at the local parish four times a year, which is like not it, right? But they do have like, they'll have a whole week of services leading up in preparation for taking the sacrament. And that tells you they're not memorialists, right? I mean, they actually believe they're going to be partaking the body and blood of Christ when the sacrament comes around. But I think there's something to learn from that in that like, we need to prepare for the taking of the Lord's Supper together as a church. And that needs to be done in some way, somehow, before the service of the Lord's Supper begins. Um, I brought up a point earlier about, well, you know, Paul ties curses to um, improper eating of the uh, Lord's Supper. And then I thought, but wait a second. Hold up, hold up. I, I, I pray, I'm a good, I'm a good wannabe Anglican. I, I, I pray my morning prayer in the calm prayer quite often. And one of the things I read in there is Psalm 95 every, every time you do it. And Psalm 95, is, 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 it takes place before the readings for the morning happen. And what the function of Psalm 95 is an exhortation to interact properly with the word when you encounter it. So, um, uh, so Psalm 95, uh, if I could just read the whole psalm. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. The Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are all the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it. And his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years long was I greed with this generation and said, as the people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways, and to whom I swear my wrath, that they should not enter into my rest." So there in scripture is an exhortation and when coming to hear the word preached, when coming to hear the word God, you know, you can either listen to it in faithfulness and enter God's rest, or you can listen to it in unfaithfulness and never enter God's rest and be like Israel that's, you know, dies in the wilderness. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure the necessity for proper, um, proper preparation for the Lord's Supper, um, is really like any is it any different from like preparation for proper hearing of the word preached in the whole service as a whole? So I I'm, I'm resending that argument now, but I wanted to, I wanted to throw it out there to see what would happen. Uh, I guess a, a final thought. Let me just like share my own experience as someone who's now you know gone from weekly communion to you know monthly or biweekly communion. And I'd say overall, it's God's grown me in it because I've had to learn to be a bit more charitable towards um, the people that practice monthly communion um into into my ministers and to really think through it and so i think i've grown in charity for the other views recognizing that it's is a tradition you know that uh descends from um the reform tradition in general and you know i i have to be okay with that but also the I mean the truth is that i i have missed taking the lord's supper weekly i mean it's it's made me look toward it's made me look towards sunday with, with less excitement than I, than I did when I was taking the Lord's Supper every single week. But now it's like the Sundays I get most jazz is the Sundays more taking the Lord's Supper. Um, and so maybe that, maybe, and I thought at first, maybe it's because my view of the word is too low. And I thought about it and like, well, maybe it was, and I think my, my view of the word's gotten a lot higher. But it still doesn't negate that, um, that I, you know, the, the cosmic mystery of the incarnation is not being participated in every Sunday the way it is when we take the Lord's Supper. And so I, st- I still think I, I, in my ideal world, we're taking the Lord's Supper weekly. And I, I think I have um, not profited by taking it less than I was before. So those are, those are my thoughts on the Lord's Supper. Well, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share before we transition to what we're reading? Um, I can comment. Uh, I kind of relate a little bit to what you're saying, because like I said, I wrote the letter to my uh, session requesting weekly communion, and they thought my reasoning uh, was pretty sound, and they they agreed with a lot of it. But the problem was is that 
our associate pastor had moved into a senior pastor position uh, after he went to California. And so because of that, we only had one teaching elder now who could validly administer the, the supper and all that. So if he was sick or something like that, then there'd be no Lord's supper and all that. And so that was kind of their thing. But because of that, they were saying, oh, well, during Lent and during Advent, we'll do it every Sunday. And so I've experienced it every Sunday versus the monthly. And I can definitely say that the weekly is just very beneficial and everybody benefits from it or everyone there. They're also enjoying it a lot as well. And I think the reason why is because it always when you see the supper, you see you again, you know, a lot of us, especially the, you know, crypto confessional Protestants or even crypto Roman Catholics and all that. They do oh, the idea that it's a memorial. Oh, that sounds like evangelicalism, the stuff that I left behind. No, I don't want to remember. I want to participate. Dang it. You know, and so we don't think about, it. but no, it, it really is there. You are remembering what Christ did for you. It is a sign of what Christ has done for you. And seeing that every Sunday, re remembering, yes, remembering a memorial every Sunday, it was very beneficial because in every sermon, it always does come back to Christ and him crucified, died, buried, and risen. But specifically taking the time to think about that and to participate in that, I think that's just very beneficial because not every Sunday is going to focus on that as much as it should. And I think with the weekly communion, you will always end every service knowing that Christ has died and Christ has risen for you. And I think that's a beautiful thing about the supper. So I know we've been going real hard on our super mystical, real presence talk here, but you know, even with memorial, it, it is a memorial and you should remember it every single Sunday. So that's all I have to say there. True. But I, I do want, I do make, I do want to make a note. We will never stop with our highfalutin mystical. Oh, of course not. Segmentology. No, both okay. the, you know, memorial and that mystical, they go together perfectly. You know, Athanasius said, you know, God became man so that man could become God. And that happens in the Lord's Supper, you know, and I know I, I can't just leave that there. You know, Athanasius mm -hmm. is talking about God becoming man in order for man not to become God in an ontological sense, but to imitate, to Im imitate God, to become like him. So I, I couldn't just leave that quote without explaining it <laughs> as, 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 as much as I wanted to. But yeah. um, with the Osus, guys, it's real. It happens in the Eucharist. But Joran, so do you want to have the last word? Um, I think Matthew should start recording readings of John Owen so I can fall asleep easier at night. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Matthew, uh, the, you know, I keep on telling people like, yeah, I've read John Dathan's Sea of Baptism. And that's like not not true. Uh, but I just listened to your reading of John Dathan's you know, Baptism when you recorded it. So you should do. You should do more of those. We should get paid for it, man. You should like start a Patreon or something. Honestly, yeah, that'd be that'd be neat. <laughs> Could be Matthew. I can just keep up story for time hour. Yeah, Matthew, come on, you're 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 a poor college kid. You don't you don't need to do that. That's true. Yeah, I could start charging people. The worker is worthy of his wages. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you noticed, Josh wasn't here today, and we just want to make it known it's because Josh. He doesn't like the word supper. So. <laughs> he's just, he's, he, he actually called me here this morning. He's like, Jonathan, like, you know, <laughs> Christ came back in 70 AD. So like, why are we still practicing the sacraments? So I was like, yeah, yeah, you're off the podcast permanently. So, um, no, no, he just, uh, yes, it's, 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 it's that season of the year, man. It's finals and tests and, you know, him, not want to talk about the word supper so that's okay we still love him um he's uh he's currently dead on my couch right now he's yeah, just passed yeah. out like he's a little sick he's sick so. he's sick, yeah. he's sick. That's um, what it yeah. is. so what are y'all reading well actually let's do let's do this instead because we're all writing papers we're probably not reading a whole lot um what are y'all writing I'm about reading. you're reading what are you jordan tell us what you're reading about um i just got i just got a couple new books from the from bright light a christian bookstore around here Ooh. um one is called uh, The Study of Theology by Richard Moeller, and it's on the fourfold division um, or fourfold curriculum at like a theological schools. So like biblical, historical, systematic and practical theology. And like he's basically defending that. And uh, it's really good. It's basically defending that against 
different views of curriculum and like kind of this anti-intellectual kind of thing that's going on that he was talking about. And then I recently, I got my tax return, so I had to spend it all, but I got, um, I got the creeds of Christendom by Philip Schaff. It's like a three volume mm-hmm. set. And I just love Philip Schaff, honestly. And, uh, he's an awesome historian. So it's just, all, it has all the Latin Greek creeds. Um, and it's funny, he, he'll, he'll um, take like Peter's creed that you are, you know, you are the Christ, the son of God, and he'll put that in there. <laughs> it's just funny because it's only like seven words or something. Nice. And he'll do that all over the New Testament. But he also has like Greek and Latin ones. Mm-hmm. And then he has all the original languages with him too. So it's, it's cool. You can learn a little Latin, a little German with Luther and a little uh, Greek. So, yeah. Oh, oh, and I'm writing, uh, I just wrote a, a exegesis paper on romans 13 1 through 7 like the civil authorities and how we should deal with them <laughs> and uh it was um i had to rush a little bit don't tell anyone but uh it was good so oh dr Bedrick, he's, he's totally watching the podcast i yeah. wish i wish he was watching the podcast. Yeah, i was about to say don't tell anyone this thing's gonna be public <laughs> yeah. yeah matthew i'll send that i'll just send that segment to him okay <laughs> All right. Um, what I'm reading and writing right now. Uh, honestly, my reading stuff that I said uh, the last episode is probably the same because I haven't had a whole bunch of time to like really get into uh, those readings and all that. But in regard to things I'm writing, you know, this, this semester just finished up for me. And uh, one of the more interesting classes that I've had uh, is called the Cambridge Platonists. They're a group of uh, Anglican theologians in the 17th century, not super Anglican. They did not like Calvinists at all. They hated Calvinists. And they also did not like Aristotle. Boy, did they not like Aristotle. But one uh, Cambridge Platonist adjacent guy, his name is Joseph Glanville. John Frame. In- oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Shots fired. Um, but Joseph Glanville, he's not actually a Cambridge Platonist proper because he didn't actually go to Cambridge. He went to Oxford. But he also an avid Aristotle hater, like many theologians of our day. And one of the things, though, that he did is he based one of his reasons for hating Aristotle is he's basically saying you can you can know nothing about philosophy any, at all. You're basically, you know nothing. You can, So therefore you can't be dogmatic about any philosophy. I mean, all these smart guys explain things so differently. Therefore you shouldn't really think of anything. And so he's employing a form of skepticism that can be traced back to Sextus Empiricus. And the point of my essay that I'm writing is uh, I'm comparing his use of skepticism against establishing philosophical dogma Um, and him throwing out Aristotle to do that. I'm comparing him to the counter reformers in France and how they threw out Aristotle and also employed skepticism against the French Calvinists in order to say, you can't know anything without the magisterium. Therefore, because you can't know anything, you must submit to the church in Rome. And it's really interesting. Uh, If you want to read up more on that, and basically, um, I'll just put it bluntly, how the Roman Catholics caused the Enlightenment, read Richard H. Popkin's uh, essay entitled, uh, where is it, where is it, where is it? It's entitled Skepticism and the Counter-Reformation in France. Uh, I've been using that as my source a lot, and it's it's mind-blowing. It's a really crazy essay, but so in the essay that I wrote, I'm just comparing uh, the different forms of skepticism employed by Joseph Glanville and the counter-reformers and showing how they both rely on Montaigne and Sexist Empiricus and its consequences. So yeah, that's what I wrote on. So you guys, you don't have to go to RPC to be awesome like Matthew is. So that sounds great, Matthew. You just have to take really niche good. philosophy classes. Yeah, just really niche ones. Um, yeah, if so you want to be un- if you want an unaccredited degree and be awesome, come to RPC. Come to RPC. <laughs> <laughs> um, um. Anyway, I've been writing my exegesis paper also for Romans. I've been I wrote it on uh, Romans fifteen fourteen to twenty one. Just turned it in last night, um, and that's it's such an interesting passage because Paul. Uh, straight up in verse 16 he's kind of explaining like he writes the book of romans and he never like says why he's writing it and so the romans are probably like okay this is awesome paul but like why do you think you're in charge of us and like why did you write this book and paul goes well i'm in charge of you because i'm a minister set aside you know you know to the gentiles and the reason i'm 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 I'm, like writing this to you is because i'm actually a it literally 
a priest of the gospel. And it's my goal, it's my job to offer you, the Gentiles, as a sacrifice to God. And this is an eschatological fulfillment of uh, Isaiah 52, when the Messiah is going to sprinkle the nations. So actually, I am, I am participating in the priesthood of Christ. And my goal is to offer you up as living sacrifices to God. So it's Sounds just, like oh, I for, it's bad. like, oh, what is that Roman Catholicism? Is Paul calling himself a priest, you know? Um, and the answer is it's not Roman Catholicism. It's just New Testament and New Testament ministers share in the priesthood of Christ in a special, a special way. And if you think that that's crazy, you know, I have a good Presbyterian here, J.B. Fesco, and I use this in the paper, and he says, everything Paul has written demonstrates that there is a priestly order in the New Testament, that these priests offer sacrifices to God, and they worship him in his temple. First, Paul stated that he participated in the creation of a priestly order. Yes, Aaron's line of, uh, of Levi has passed away with the shadows and types of the Old Testament. They have been fulfilled in the person and work of our high priest. Yeah, just as Aaron, the high priest, had assistant priests to aid him in bringing sacrifices, so too Christ has servant priests to assist him. So there's a food very for Rocky today. Very, very interesting. That's, that's, a, that's a Presbyterian right there. That's a Presbyterian. Yeah, look at that. Um, I think um, and, you're about to convert Matthew to Anglicanism. Well, <laughs> hey, he, he, read he read a Presby. He read a That's not even, a, it's not even an Anglican distinctive. Actually, in the Westminster um, uh, Assembly, when they made the former Presbyterian Church government, they quote Old Testament prophecies about priests offering sacrifices in Levites in the, in the eschaton and apply them to New Testament ministers. So I'm not even being an Anglican right now. I'm just being a straight up good Presbyterian. I'm going to call my anyway, state Presbyterian. Uh, I'm going to call my pastor Father Keen. <laughs> Don't do that. That's cringe. No, I won't. I won't people, hey, call, call no man father, okay? <laughs> I'm not calling. I'm calling my dad Chris now. Sorry, Chris. Exactly. Can't call you dad. <laughs> even, even believe the Bible. <laughs> Well, hey, it's uh, it's that time. I know Matthew needs to head out. He has big, important things. Apparently, he's like slaying some like serpent or like alligator. I know he's a Florida man, so something yeah, alligator like that's going sure. on. Um, kind of like... But thank you all for watching this episode uh, or listening to this episode, of the Renek Products of Podcast. If you enjoyed it, uh, leave us a five star review on iTunes or Spotify, or you know, if you're watching on YouTube, you know, subscribe, comment, share it with your friends. If you didn't enjoy it. Uh, leave a five-star review on Spotify or iTunes and make sure to subscribe and we'll catch you on the next episode of the Ironic Protestant podcast. Thanks for watching.